All right, welcome to 14th of September, Microsoft Developer Sync Meeting. Okay, so last I checked, we're still mid sprint. Excellent. So um, we can do a quick uh, go around and check on status, uh, any blockers or things that have come up. Um, and then if there's any agenda items that people would like to discuss, we can uh, add those in here. I've got a few that I'd like to talk about. So um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, gets. Oh, you always start with the person who's woken up the earliest. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, in terms of my tickets and stuff, um, uh, look, yesterday I uh, got derailed a little bit. I've been adding a few tickets to the sprint, <laughs> being naughty. Um, but uh, it, it, there was a discussion started in the in the community forums. Um, so it's kind of been bubbling away a little bit, but uh, it was, you know, started getting discussed in a bit more detail, which I think is good around how we um, how we process pull requests and how we process contributions, code contributions from the community. Um, cause it's something that we've talked about on here and so they've seen us talking about it, but, um, they haven't seen the translation of that into practice so much. Um, and so they wanted to ask, you know, what the go is there, which I think is pretty fair enough. Um, and so I started a new process spec around, you know, that end to end process of, of how, how we take in community contributions around code and, and, um, the aim is to <coughs> see how, you know, what the expectations are, um, of us as a company and of the community, both as, you know, code authors, as well as code reviewers, um, you know, community members can be, can be reviewers as well. Uh, put some, you know, some expectations there around, you know, timeframes and, um, try and tighten up our, um, our labeling process so that that's clearer about what the status of, of any PR is, like rather than a, a pull request just sitting there with no comments, you know, open and, or, you know, with a comment that's like, yeah, this looks great, but it never got merged and has it been actually code reviewed or is that just referring to, you know, this seems like, nice behavior, um, uh, all that sort of stuff. So, um, spent a few hours yesterday, um, uh, starting to, to try and map that out in more detail. Um, and yeah, as I said, I, I hope that we can actually lay down what we think realistic expectations are so that community members can be, can be confident that if they spend the time contributing code, then, then we're going to spend the time, well, someone's going to spend the time and let them know, you know, something about that. Um, because yeah, I still, you know, we're still not keeping up with, um, with the current pull requests coming in, let alone the, the backlog from the last, you know, X number of years. So, um, anyway, so I'll, I um I will post the link to that. It was in it was in the community chat, but I'll I'll make sure that everyone gets it and post it in the in the team chat as well. Um uh but yeah, it felt like that was more important than processing other PRs at the moment. Um and yeah, it also raised the, the question around our, um, so I also spent an hour yesterday trying to get through some of the backlog of email support requests. And then I was, you know, that made me think, why am I spending an hour responding to people who are not paying members and who aren't contributing to the community at all? And I'm spending an hour helping them rather than spending an hour helping the people who are trying to help us. 
Um, and so I think it's something that I'm, I'm considering whether we should actually turn off the email support form on the website <coughs> um, and, you know, encourage people to go to the community forums and the, and the community chat for that, um, which we can help people there, but it means that every, every piece of help to give helps the community rather than just helping that one individual person. Um, and at some point, I, you know, I, I think it's worth providing some mechanism for paid supporters to, to get email support, but whether that's something we can do straight away is, is another question. Okay. Uh, so that is, yeah, <laughs> two things that weren't really related to aspirant, but that's where I'm at at the moment. Right. So. Well, and, but are part of your regular set of responsibilities, right? As, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that's clear to anyone who's listening, um, but uh, Gez lives in the uh, in the space where he's you know, part time community support and part time developer. So. Um, yeah. And when we say we have three developers, we also all do other things for Microsoft on the side, whether it's like keeping infrastructure running or, you know, yeah, responding to support requests or blah, 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 blah. Like, we right. all do a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, I think that's a good thought in terms of email support. Um, yeah, I don't think that we've promised anyone email support, right? So if that's taking up a measurable amount of your time, then we should um, definitely refer those people to the forums for support. Uh, I, in terms of you know the document that you were talking about, um, working with the community on the PR process, uh, I looked at that, um, and you know I think uh, I think you're on a good track there. I think we need to make it clear to our community. Um, what our goals are, what our objectives are. Uh, you know, the our repositories are a, you know, as we move towards uh, deploying something that's going to be a commercial product, right? That we need to be able to support long term. Um, we're going to have to, I think, look at uh, the way we handle merges and things like that uh, very carefully. Right? We don't want to, you know, there may be really cool features that people are submitting, but um, you know, if they're not something that's uh, essential or on the roadmap for you know a particular implementation of the you know uh, of the software, then you know, we have to be careful about uh, you know a lot of things. You know, the usual concerns like software bloat, uh, you know, maintenance, uh, performance, things like that, right? So uh, I think the new system that allows us to have modules that can be compiled in or um, uh, you know, optionally linked in. Uh, I think that's a that's a good path forward for features that are not necessarily on our roadmap or might be sort of edge cases or uh, um, you know of, mm -hmm. of interest to only a particular set of users. Um, and you know, maybe we'll have to explore with the community a, a way of implementing those. Uh, and maybe we even expose that to the marketplace, for example, right? So that it's not just skills, but maybe other parts of the software that can be can be loaded that way. Um, but um, you know, when we release the Mark II commercially, uh, you know, not just the dev kit version of it, um, we're going to have to be a lot more circumspect about what we uh, make easy to install on people's uh, end devices because, you know, it has to be curated in a way that uh, they can trust that the stuff that they're putting on their system is, is safe to use. So, um, so yes, yeah, so there's a lot of considerations there in terms of, you know, uh, integration testing and, and uh, making sure that a, a submission has, you know, all of the things that are going to make it possible for us to maintain it going forward. So, mm. um, yeah. So I've seen I've seen the, that document there, and I think you know we should continue to work on that with the community, and um, yeah, and and continue this process of, um, you know, as as we're doing this week. Explaining what our roadmap is, sharing that with the community, and uh, you know, taking the the good ideas that are arising there and, and bringing them into our roadmap at the appropriate place. 
So you know, there's a lot of activity right now around the come to play skill, um, and uh, you know, I think that's a really good thing to uh, to develop in a thoughtful way. Um, and if you know, uh, if that's moving too slow for a particular person, well, I mean, they can be doing that development on their own, and you know, uh, that uh, when we have the bandwidth to appropriately support it, you know, we will, right? But, um, well, but I yeah. think that's a that's a good example because, like, you know, their their PRs where they are being held back at the moment, but there's a clear process of like why they're being held back and. Um, and you know how we're trying to move forward on that on that thing i think the you know the broader issue is that you know people have got like you know three-year-old prs that that are actually really good changes but they just never got touched you know um and they put a lot of work into them and and all that sort of stuff um but i also think this is this is a chance for us to, to um tighten up some of the expectations we have around how the process how prs happen around you know that the people, you know that that things do need to be. If they, if things aren't pitched as an idea and people just contribute, you know, a whole lot of code straight up, then, you know, there is the danger that it's not going to get merged because it doesn't align with the community or our idea of, of what's on the roadmap. And so that's that's something that people, you know, if, if they built it for themselves anyway, then then that's fine. But you know, if they're, if they're just thinking about something, then um, it's a better process to sort of pitch an idea first, get ideas, you know, have that discussion um, with the community around what that look, what that might look like and how it fits in and all that sort of stuff, and then start coding. Um, but also tighten up around what's required in a PR so that it's very clear that, like, you know, if there isn't already test coverage, then we should be adding it with every single PR. And if there isn't already sufficient documentation, then we should be adding it with every PR and or changing it with every PR because you know presumably the code changes something of value. Uh, so you know a test should be updated, a second documentation should be updated. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. So um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, and I, you know there's a lot of ways to go, right? Right. The, if somebody codes up a whole bunch of interesting functionality that they want to use and they submit it without you know, checking in first whether it's on the roadmap or if somebody else is already working on something like that, and, and um, you know, uh, that's that's a that's a fine way to go, right? If they're especially if they're doing it for themselves, um, but as long as they, you know, there's the expectation is being set that like we're not automatically going to take it, and that we may, you know, come back with feedback and say, oh, hey, this should be implemented in this other way, you know, and if you want us mm -hmm. to merge it into the branch, then you know, that'd be great, or you know, this is where it fits into our roadmap, and that's this is when we'll likely be able to take a whack at it ourselves, right? So yeah, um, yeah. I think it's just. And I guess the roadmap is. I, I think the roadmap is still that the biggest outstanding piece that I that I'm trying to think through is like, you know, we have these very very old roadmap documents which are clearly way out of date, and um, how what do we consider our roadmap? How do we communicate? How do we communicate that? How do we keep it updated? And how do we develop it together with the community? Like, mm -hmm. what, what does that look like, you know, internally, community? Is there two roadmaps? Is it a single roadmap? Is there, you know, a roadmap for the Mark II? Because it needs to say, you know, if, or for a commercial product, if that needs to, to be, you know, um, you know, there's different requirements around a commercial product versus versus something that's you know leading edge, open source, you can install on your laptop kind of thing. Um, anyway, so I think that roadmap piece is, is probably the uh, going to be going to turn into a big question. So. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, you know I think we owe it to the community to have a publicly visible roadmap that they can see what you know what our priorities are and be able to comment on them and. Uh, you know, uh, make contributions in that way as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah so and it will help them decide if there's a piece that they want to contribute to as well. You know, like right. at the moment, because there's no way of seeing what we think needs to happen next, then they're shooting in the dark. So, right. Yeah. 
so that's I mean that's a big part of what we're doing this week, right? Is Wednesday we're having a brainstorming session on um, you know priorities, and then Friday we're going to be making some at the very least high level decisions about that sort of thing. And I think at that point, you know, maybe that'll be part of our next sprint is to put some of that in a publicly facing document so that uh, we can start to get some feedback on it. All right. Well, the, hold on. The, the, the one thing that we're not doing, and, and this is one of the things that is the thesis behind which the company was founded, is leveraging the community for the creativity components of it. You know, I think that our, when we do our roadmap, it's very likely to come back with, you know, a lot of pieces surrounding, you know, basic framework functionality, right? So the ability to, um, you know, to capture information from, from users who've opted in, the ability to process that information, the ability to feed it into a, into a, a model, and then, you know, use that model to solve problems is really a big focus of the company. But, it, you know, the way I hear it or see it in the forums, a lot of the community is, is less concerned with that stuff and more concerned with you know, individual skills or capabilities that are beyond the framework. In other words, our focus is the operating system and, you know, making the overall experience work well. Their focus is the individual applications that that operating system enables. And those things aren't necessarily, you know, you can do those things in parallel, but, um, you know, we haven't necessarily done a really good job of, of you know, bringing the community into the discussion about what our priorities should be right and you know for us to go off into the into the ivory tower and say this is what you know this is what we're going to do next you know in the absence of their input uh, you know may create some conflict um and i will say the flip side of that coin is is true <coughs> you know opening the door for input in a way that is a giant distraction like at, at the end of the day most of our community members are not paying their mortgage with the stuff they're doing at Mycroft. You know, we are. And so we have a, we have a, a different set of priorities to make this thing commercially successful so that it does have longevity than the community might have immediately. Anyway, yeah. So yeah. Spending, three, spending three weeks navel gazing and having long conversations where everybody gets input is a great way to go out of business. Yeah, and this is what I mean by the, the, the roadmap page turning into a, a big question, because if it's just a, a matter of, you know, our internal team putting down our ideas and, and creating a public document, then, you know, that's like, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but, but then it's like, what is the, what is the process now and ongoing of, of, you know, having that community conversation and, um, uh, yeah, keeping keeping the community involved and managing that balance of like having having a, a clear core roadmap, but you know, in the words of Nikki Case, like leveraging the the chaos of the community to, to add variation to our ecosystem and allowing that to you know enrich everything that we do. Right, and, well, and I think that's you know that's why in particular your duties are split between the community and, you know, core development, right? Uh, you know, we've taken, we've made the decision that our community is a, an extremely valuable part of what we're doing here. And so that's why, you know, even given our very limited resources, we've dedicated somebody to focusing on that, even if it's not as, you know, as much, uh, you know, even if we'd like to be able to, you know, put more resources behind that, right? Uh, which is the case of pretty much everything we're doing now. So, um, you know, we've, we've kind of taken a position on, uh, you know, how much we can support that in conjunction with all the other work we're doing. And so that's, that's just where we are resource wise. Right. So, um, obviously we'd like to do more and the community is a great source of, uh, ideas. And, um, you know, I, I think my point is just a matter of, uh, you know, let's communicate clearly what it is. That, that we want to do uh, and for what reasons, right? So if we're focused on getting the Mark II out the door, which is the current focus, um, you know, uh, what is the, what's the reasoning behind, you know, the various decisions that we're making, right? right? So not everyone is working on the Mark II, it looks like at first glance. Uh, so why is working on the wake word and the data collection scheme, you know, important to getting the Mark II out the door? 
Uh, so, you know, we can we can uh, make that a little more obvious to the community. And um, you know, likewise with all the other you know parts of the system that we're we're working on in terms of you know there's the uh, you know there's the update system that we've been having a lot of you know back channel discussions about um, and things of that nature that are going to be essential to getting the Mark II out the door. And so that's the kind of stuff I want to put on the roadmap, right? So that people can see that that's what you know that's what our focus is. Um, and uh, and you know the roadmap doesn't necessarily have to be it's not a schedule, right? It's a, it's a list of priorities, and some of them are going to be you know pretty high level, and some of them are going to be um, you know fairly detailed. But uh, and you know other things that might be on that roadmap are you know the kinds of changes that we're looking for the community to contribute to, right? So it might be that you know in in the current uh, on the in our current phase of development, the things that we're looking for from the community are contributions to the essential skills, bug fixes, um, improvements to the core infrastructure and things like that, right? And um, on a um, opportunistic basis, we may, you know, roll in some some changes from left field that look really great, things that we didn't anticipate, right? And that's that's what Gez's job is to do, is to kind of uh, to look for those opportunities and, and you know, take advantage where we can. Um, but uh, but at the same time, you know, there may be functions that are uh, that are great to you know to, to think about uh, implementing, but or, or incorporating. But you know, we're just not sure of, or they don't have the proper testing support, or might be you know uh, considered um, you know like uh, a little used feature that might just add to the complexity of the software and that sort of thing. So. You know, maybe that's something that we uh, we develop a system whereby people can contribute modules that will end up being in the core repository, so they're checked in and they're you know they're available to anybody who wants to use them, but they're not necessarily enabled by default. Um, you know, things of that nature. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think we need to come up with a solid plan here and communicate that with, that with the community, um, and uh, you know, I think also make it clear like what what we're able to do and what we're not. Right. So. We know we have a backlog of PRs, uh, some of which are very good and are a couple of years old, and we should, you know, we should definitely get around to doing them. Uh, but, you know, as a matter of priority, uh, we just don't have the resources to do it right now. So, um, something else I wanted to to add was um, something we could, we could probably do a, a little bit better job of that um, probably wouldn't take a whole lot of time would be uh, identifying things like in our, you know, the bugs. In our essential skills, for example, that are in our Jira but aren't exposed elsewhere, you know, those are things that hey, you know, if you want to help out, here's some stuff we know is wrong or we know needs to be fixed um, that you know could probably be fixed pretty easily if somebody spends a little time on it, um, you know, and exposing that to the community. So if somebody you know had some free time and wanted to contribute, here's some things you know we know of, um, you know, that could help us out in the short term even. Yeah, I, I actually think that there is a, an issue in our ticket system right now to link our GitHub and Jira ticket systems together somewhere. Um, yeah, there is. So, uh, yeah, so it's one of those kind of meta issues that uh, you know we just have to put on the on the priority list. So. Okay. Um, any anything else um, aside from that? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I've been doing some stuff to fix the, um, been talking with Chris and okay, um, to <coughs> fix the what comp Docker build that, um, that broke, uh, and we seem to be back in business, but there might be some more tweaks currently. It, anyway, I won't bother going into the detail. Um, Maybe, yeah, I guess this is all, uh, I'm, I'm not going to finish all my tickets by the end of the sprint. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we can take a look at that uh, afterwards. Oops. All right, okay, we'll take a look at that then um, uh, a little later and see what, uh, see what we need to do about that, if anything. Uh, okay, uh, so Chris Bear. So we had an outage today. Um, I don't know if everybody saw the matter most. And 
home. So I spend my day dealing with that and I'm not quite done yet. Um, but really the crux of the issue was that the MySQL crashed again on WordPress. So um, it's the first time I've had to deal with it. Usually Gez <laughs> is, is all over that, but um, it came up in the forums or not in forums in the chat this morning uh, that people could not download the Pycroft image and that's what it traced back to. So um, in the incident report, the short term solution was to restart the MySQL server. Uh, and that seemed to fix everything um, momentarily. Uh, short, longer term is what I've been working on for the rest of the day uh, since I've restarted the server. Um, figured now since my brain's on it, I might as well work on that ticket that's there for, um, you know, getting this um, done. So I want to share my screen here for a second. So this is, um, we have a droplet out there, a DigitalOcean droplet that is the Mycroft maintenance page droplet that we're supposed to be using for um, for these maintenance issues where I have to take down the, the site completely um, and the droplet completely. <laughs> um, you know, there's different, there's two different scenarios, right? I mean, if you're just doing WordPress maintenance and there, I think there's a plugin we use that'll, you know, just save the site's down, but the droplet's still up. But if we take the droplet down, we need something, another mechanism to say, hey, we have, we're doing maintenance. Um, so that's what this screen is. Uh, I pulled that graphic from our WordPress uh, maintenance <laughs> um, functionality and just threw some text on there. Um, so right now I have that running, that IP address up there is our, our new server um, for this purpose. So uh, we can pretty this up later if we want to, um, but that's kind of what I'm working on right now is getting this to a point where, and I'm using our test WordPress instance right now to get this tested. Um, making it easy to flip a bit basically that points to this when we want to do something um, and then um, implementing that. I think Gaz pointed out the last time we did this, we just used the old WordPress instance to do this and that instance isn't around anymore. So um, this was our long-term solution um, was to use this maintenance droplet. So um, that's kind of what I'm doing now is just getting that all set up. It's, I'm, it is a ticket in the sprint, so I am <laughs> working towards the sprint, but uh, it's not what I said I was going to do today. <laughs> so, uh, all right, fair enough. It's not really a blocker, but yeah. Uh, so, two comments on that. The uh, when the WordPress site goes down, Selenium still functions, right? So people can use all the backend services and go to home.microft.ai and stuff like that, right? Correct. Well, so, I mean, yes, they're, they're not dependent on one another, let's put it that way. They, they could both be down, but right. <laughs> one does right. not depend on the other. <laughs> Correct. Uh, okay, that's what I thought. So uh, maybe there should be a link uh, on that really basic front page that, you know, some text and a link that says, um, you know, uh, our, you know, home.microft.ai home is up and running. You can go here to access your account, right? Uh, we don't want people to not be able to do that since they're, since they can. Um, and um, what was the other issue? Oh, I was wondering um, if we could just use it. Well, not that it matters, but um, we've got the test.microft AI server as well, right? Um, and so I have two questions about that. One is why not just divert people to that if our main site is down, because presumably that runs on a different server. And second, why can't we, can we promote the content that's on test dot over to the main site now? Because I don't see why we shouldn't. So the answer to question one, so yes, we can definitely, I can add, I can add a, a URL link in there pretty easily that points to home into that screen. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, as far as pointing to test, we could do that. Um, test 
you may have a slightly different user experience because we, are, we may be testing things on test. <laughs> um, they may see things that are you know in progress if we did that, um, and maybe even things we don't want people to see. It depends on what <laughs> you know yeah. what iteration okay. we are in test, That's which great. is why I, I kind of went this. No. Way. Um, but as far as yeah, the promotion thing, I'll let Gaz, I'll let Gaz talk about that. There, there are people now jumping on tests at Microsoft AI to see all of our top secret plans. <laughs> well, we're not live streaming yet, so they're not just now jumping. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll first deflate everyone's expectations and let you know that there's nothing secret <laughs> on tests at Microsoft AI. Um, <laughs> other than uh, a new a new contact page, which is what I talked about before. Um, Propose possible. Um, yeah, I guess the 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 one well one point is that this maintenance page should be up quite very briefly, um, which you know when we are obviously you want your site down for as long time as possible, but like balancing like how much work we put into one thing versus you know keeping the site online for ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, kind of a thing. Um, if we point to test, then we'll need to um, put like the store into maintenance mode and that sort of thing so that um, people don't uh, do actions on the test site, assuming that it's the production site and okay. then those things get out of sync. And yeah, sort of good point. Okay, so um, that's not a good idea. I like, I like Chris, Chris's current solution of just having a static web, web page that's the home site. Um, that's fine. It is something though that we can do, you know, if there if there is ever any time where we're, you know, flat may get, may go down for where we may need it down for a longer period, we can clone the entire flat, um, put it onto a, a different droplet and and jump back and forward. Um, it just requires That's a lot more something I attempted today. I was I I made a, a snapshot of the Production WordPress droplet and put it on a on a host and you know try oh, to yeah. that. it didn't work out all that great. I mean, I, I thought maybe it'd be that, it would be that easy, but <laughs> it was not. No, so. <laughs> no, definitely not that easy. Because so, there's like you know there's protections in place so that like you know Stripe our payment processing backend, you know, um, the way that it's set up at, at the moment um, is that you know. Depending on how people like to purchase a membership, some of our memberships are actually driven by WordPress, like the recurring memberships. And so then WordPress will, will ping Stripe to charge, to recharge them, you know, on a regular interval. Um, whereas the ones from our, our Lini, uh, Stripe is managing that recurring process. And so if we then had multiple instances of the, of the site, then it could potentially charge people twice for the same, um, for the same membership. And so, yeah, there's some protections in place so that, that not both of those can exist at the same time. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I think that could be a longer term goal would be to have an A, an a and a B site maybe, um, have, it, have that set up that way. But yeah, I, I was, it, it doesn't sound like it's a, you know, couple no, hour no. version. <laughs> okay, so yeah, carry on. I uh, put in a link to the, um, to the Selenium backend so people can get there and, um, yeah, and I would like to promote tests to home, unless there's any reason not to. Uh, I think I've been pushing all the changes across, so that like the navigation changes and everything are, are now are they? live on. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did that late last week, I think. Oh, uh, okay. I might not have noticed. Yeah, that. sorry, it it did take me a while. <laughs> gotcha. All right, I see that now. Thanks. All right, um, so moving on then. Yeah. And Derek, if you want to pretty this up and give me some other, another image or HTML or something I can use, this is this is just that image and then some text I threw up there. So if there's, if you want to uh, make this different, then it's pretty easy to change the HTML. The the bigger thing is getting all the. Yeah. Don't let that hold you up. That's a let's yeah. make a yeah, make a ticket lower for. Priority. And make, yeah, make a yeah. ticket to pretty that up at some point in the future, but I've got other things I want Derek to work on. <laughs> it's fine. I think okay. it's fine. Uh, presumably, presumably, we don't want it up for very long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, so that's what I've been working on. Um, my didn't I should finish this up today. And part of finishing this up will be once I get the proxy set up and all that good stuff going, then I will actually sometime tonight point to this <laughs> um, upgrade the droplet. Hopefully, hopefully that will fix our memory errors. Um, hopefully, well, we've already up, we've already upgraded it once and it didn't fix it. So, um, <laughs> oh really? Hopefully, yeah. We went from one gigabyte to two uh, like a year or two or a year ago or something um, on this droplet. So. Cool. Hopefully this will fix it. But the other, another solution I saw doing the research was um, in the config file for MySQL, you can uh, downgrade the amount of memory it asks for when it asks for a buffer. Um, and that might help too. So that we'll do the increase in um, droplet size first. And if it creeps back up, um, we'll have another potential um, um, report. It's a freaking word play, trust site. Why, why is it so hard? Anyway. Um... <sighs> All right. Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, I, I think because it's, because it's a freaking word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like amazing <laughs> software, but it's also it's its own beast. And I think, often, like having it hosted by a, a dedicated WordPress host, I think is really the the best long term option. Well, um, and we also talked about some of the stuff moving to Selene as well, but that's also a longer term. Yeah, yeah, integrating all the things. Very, very. Yeah. Very, very long term, yes. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so Derek, do you have uh, any uh, news or blockers? Um, no, no real blockers. Um, let's see, I got Ken's device uh, wrapped up. Uh, I think I told you via email, I was waiting on parts. Uh, just the last the cables I had for the display, just, just a little too short. Um, so I had to quickly get some. Order. And so I have been messing with mine a little bit today. Uh, this is actually it running um, the, uh, the Qt version. And they um, we asked them to do a quick screen rotation addition to the UI for us. Um, so it actually does display in horizontal format. Of course, collect, not all the skills are going to be optimized for that. But anyway, um, so all this, this stuff brought up fine and everything, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been able to test any audio stuff. I just haven't been able to configure it to be running off the USB. So, so I do want to, I do want to go back to the skills aren't configured for, for that, uh, orientation. So when, when we originally met with the blue systems team, the construct for the visualizations was a card construct, right? So, all of the visualizations were designed to be um, in symmetrical XY format. So they were all square. And if you were gonna do a horizontal screen, you would simply lay the two cards side by side instead of one on top of the other, right? And the, the thing I really liked about that proposal and that approach is, you know, we can stack them and go vertical. We can put two cards next to each other and go horizontal. We can put one card on a watch, right? And then, you know, the the swipe over, you know, if you had a, a display that required four cards, you could put the first card on the watch and swipe to the next two, right? Um, and the same for a horizontal screen. And then if you have a full size screen, you could put either four or six cards up there for the for the display. And so my, my question is, did we not do that? No, I mean, not initially. Well, uh, no, there are, there are cards, like there is a, um, you can choose to use cards in the in the interface. So if a skill can choose to create a, a card based interface. Um, but a lot of them they use things like, you know, if it's just text, for example, you just say show text and then it responsibly um, adapts to the to the size and shape of your screen. So if you you know which is not card based but it but it's responsive. Yeah, and, and the idea of the card was designed at the time, the card was essentially a portrait format for the Mark II at a four inch, roughly a four inch screen. So if you go up to a 10 inch screen, you might be able to get three or four of those cards on the screen mm -hmm. to fill that horizontal space, right? But that doesn't mean necessarily the card information, if just by itself, 
would look good in a horizontal format. So we're talking about actually redesigning the base card, so to speak. That makes sense. Okay. Well, that so, sounds like sorry. a bigger discussion, but yeah, the answer is yeah. John yeah, so, didn't get what he wanted. It's well, not, I didn't get what was promised. It, yes. In fairness, it wasn't well, it wasn't my idea, but I liked it when it was when right. it was brought up because it it does provide the flex, a lot of flexibility. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is like, yes, you could put two cards, like you could put two weather cards on here, but I think they'd be too small in this display. How, so what I think we need it, we really need to think of is is more of responsive type design. In that okay, if you've got within the card, within one card, like right now we use a lot of icons like the sun above, you know, the temperature, right? So those on a horizontal display kind of would look better side by side as opposed to stack. But that's the, the, those two things aren't actually on separate cards, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, it's part of it is there, the cards are there, but it's not exactly the same problem, if, if that makes sense. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, yeah, it does sound like we need to have a discussion about that because that's a it's a fairly uh, encompassing, uh, you know, graphic interface architecture issue. Um, yeah, it's it's a it, it's a very principal item, like first principal item, and I'm I'm not married to it, but I liked the idea and I understand some of the challenges with it, but if we did something that was extensible like that that allowed us to stack cards, you know, horizontally, vertically in arrays or however in order to build displays that are display information in a seamless way across multiple screen sizes and formats. And we can do that as a first principle, you know, that saves us a boatload of time on down the line when, you know, some a company approaches us about doing end cap displays, which is <coughs> gonna happen. They're gonna wanna do, you know, a, 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 they're gonna wanna do a portrait big screen TV at the end of an end cap in a store so that people can walk up and talk to it. Well, if we haven't really thought that through, now we're going to have to redesign all the graphics for all of the skills that that customer wants in order to work in that format. And it seems to me to be be a good idea to to plan to abstract that now as opposed to going back and fixing it later. So it sounds like this is something that's going to come up as part of our uh, choice of uh, frameworks as well, you know, Qt versus Kibi, that sort of thing. Um, so we should add this to the discussion. Uh, if you know, it sounds like there was a you know some substantial work put into the GUI discussion and you know what the interface would look like and how the users would interact with it. We should find that and uh, figure out why it diverged from that plan and figure out what our new plan is going forward. So, yeah, I also don't think there's anything that um, forces or coerces skill developers to use that. You know, I think it's out there, but it, you know, but it's some more of the even if we do all our skills that way, if another skill developer doesn't and they turn the screen, then it just, you know, who knows what it's going to look like. <laughs> well, but that's, the, I didn't think that's the, that's an issue though, right? I mean, yeah. Well, every, yeah. every, I every skill, that, like all these skills work within a framework, right? If they are, if, if a skill can just like take over the whole system without uh, any sort of expectations about how the other skills are using the screen or, yeah, you know, uh, that sort of thing, then, you know, we have not done a service to our skill developers. So we need to, well, that's where we need to figure that out. Yeah, that's where the fleshed out API comes in for the QBs. Right. Okay. So it yeah, sounds well, like. Yeah, well, it's also like we can, we can, we've, Nick, we've got to give people the framework and the guidelines to, to create the best experience possible. But being an open source project, it also means that people can do something completely different and, you know, make something that breaks all of that. Um, and so that will happen, but that then probably won't get into the marketplace, you know, so. Yeah. And, and the, you know, for us, you know, it's just like anything else, right? Like we just need to set a standard, not, not just need to, that kind of dim diminishes how hard it is to do that, but we need to set a standard. Hey, this is how, this is how Mycroft, you know, that the Mycroft display needs to be organized. This is what we expect. If you want your skill pulled into master, or if you want your contribution pulled into master, it has to meet these standards. And you know we're we're starting to do that relative to testing and relative to void comp, but we also you know as we deploy a GUI, that should be the same. Like here's the standard: if you want your application included as part of our GUI, as part of our standard build, you know it needs to meet these standards. 
uh, and they need to be clearly communicated partially for the for the open source community, but then also partially for our own review. If we don't set up a good standard and somebody submits something, then it becomes really, you know, does Derek like it? Great, then it goes in. Do I like it? No, I hate it. So it doesn't go, I mean, if we have a standard, it avoids, um, it avoids, you know, it becoming a personal opinion thing. Yeah, some of that can be coerced through an API too. Like if there's something you really want, you know, you can actually code to kind of guide people in a certain direction in some cases. So that's something we can consider as well when we code up an API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's other, yeah, there's a lot of considerations, you know, there's how much CPU does it utilize to run their fancy graphic interface, you know, things like that. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things to consider there. Okay, so uh, let's make sure we take a, a ticket to uh, include that in our, our GUI discussions. I thought that was, that issue had been more resolved than it is. Okay, so um, any updates on the hardware, Derek? Uh, aside from right, so, them all working. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know pretty much everything I know, but for the rest of the team, yes. Yeah, so Kevin, um, you're gonna have a little meeting with Kevin after this. Um, Kevin is working on the board that we need for plugging the USB in to kind of basically connect the two devices via the USB. Uh, so he's working on that. Um, I don't think he's made a breakthrough on the audio issue we saw um, in terms of the amplifier playing quietly, um, but he's been working on that. Um, one of the other things we were working on was our own custom PCB to drive a driver board for the for a display that we could just buy at a reasonable price. Uh, because uh, the whole issue with all these displays and why you can't just pick any old display off the street and drive it, you know, is that they they all have different uh, display interfaces and you know different requirements and stuff. But we thought we'd found one where it was very affordable and we could drive it um, with a fairly easy to design display driver board. But it seems that might be more complicated than we thought. So we're looking at possibly having um, that just be sourced, having the driver display board be sourced. So looking into that a little bit. Um, which actually the whole camera debate on where we put the camera was kind of wrapped up in that whole thing because we were hoping to actually put the camera on that board. So that might not be, able, might have to have separate parts for that at this point. Still exploring that. Um, did I miss anything there, Michael? It sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken um, has been doing, he had some success, uh, I think, actually configuring his SJ201 to uh, work with, uh, yeah, he just has the board by itself. He does not have a full kind of assembly with the loudspeaker. Um, He's not running with the Pi 4, he's using as a USB device right now. But he was able to configure it, so that's good. Um, we'll talk about that soon. Um, so, yeah, I think that's about it on hardware. And Chris, uh, I'd like to get yours to use sometime this week. Maybe um, Johnny, I don't know, one of us could run it over to you. Um, or I can always just ship it. Um, other than that, I've been working on the GUI tagger. We had a meeting last week and uh, talked about the concepts I'd had at that point on Thursday and good feedback on that. So I've been incorporating some of those changes and we'll continue to work on that. Um, I would still like to finish the uh, first 3D printed design. Um, that's probably the thing that's in the most danger of not, not getting done. But I don't think it's it's not really blocking anyone else. It's not really going to slow us down right now. So that is where I'm at. Is it uh, slow going? Are you, are you have you been interrupted? Um, why do you think that this is in danger? Uh, well, I just you know I want to prioritize the tagger um, so that you know I'm not blocking Chris. Um, you know, that's probably my next highest priority. 
outside of getting uh, you know, the hardware devices are essentially done. So, um, yeah, that. Okay. And I, I don't know. I don't know. Depending on our, our conversation with Kevin, like if I need to do some help sourcing some of this this place driver forward stuff or anything like that, but. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's just the biggest thing is the tagger might end up taking the whole go ahead time. Gotcha. But if 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 we can get that sorted out quick, then you know it's it's in and of itself is not particularly um, anything blocking me other than just other other things. Okay. Um, I don't have any updates for today myself. Um, I had some agenda items I wanted to talk about, but we're at an hour already, and uh, these will fit nicely into our brainstorming session on Wednesday, so I think I'll just save it for then. And um, so unless there's any final questions people have, you can call in there. All right, well, I'm off to uh, talk with Kevin, and uh, we're going to try to get to the bottom of uh, the next steps on, on the hardware uh, production side of things. See you all, all right. on Wednesday.